Thank you very much. I'm just trying to get the resolution right. Okay, so hello everybody. I have recently stumbled upon this poster by the American Library Association from 1925. It advertises library work as the profession on which all other professions and occupations depend. Now I'm sure that anybody who does library work kind of likes that sentiment, I certainly do, but at the same time it makes you wonder how true that statement actually is, even back then. For instance, my grandfather was a baker. I don't think he actually depended on library work. But even more so, it makes you wonder how true that is today. And I don't have an answer on that, but to the extent that this is true today, there is something else involved, and that's software. Because software is also something on which every profession and occupation depends. Now, as the previous statement wasn't quite true, this also isn't quite true. There are certainly professions which don't depend on software today. But there is one profession which certainly does, and that's library work. Because libraries are software. The services that libraries provide are provided directly or indirectly through software. So this talk is called Lot for Applications Using the Lobbit API, which stands for Application Programming Interface. Now, why would we want to use an API? Well, because Lot for Applications means building software. And APIs make software development manageable. They allow us to build modular software with stable applications where changes in parts of the software don't require changes in all the other parts, in particular the applications. At the same time, APIs allow us to have flexible data sources. So let's take a look at what this means for the Lobbit API. So through the Lobbit API, in the Lobbit API, we make available authority data from different sources in different formats, geodata from Wikidata, and title data from our union catalog. And all this data is made available to the applications through this API. So the API really decouples the applications from these specific data sources formats and systems. So these systems, formats, and sources can change without requiring applications to change at the same time because the API provides this decoupling. All right, so the subtitle of this talk is Using the Lobbit API. Now, what does that even mean, using an API? So for web APIs, it basically means opening URLs. So it's just like opening a website, but what we want back is structured data. So let's take a look at how we can do this by using the Lobbit API. We basically just open a browser. In the URL bar, we specify we want something from our organization's API. And then we search, for instance, for HBZ, which is the organization I work for. And we get back some structured data. Now, in the address bar, we just change HBZ, say, to ZBW, and we get different data. So we're using the API. Now, the idea is that the same URL we could use in a different way. For instance, we can call that URL from the command line to get bulk downloads, for instance. So we can use curl, and we can pass a format that we want, for instance, JSON-LD, and we can pass that we want it in a zipped form, so we have less disk usage. And then we pass arbitrary queries in the form of a URL. So for instance, we can get all the holdings of a specific library, or we can get all new titles with a specific subject, and then we redirect this into the file. And what we have is local data, which is ready for offline usage, but we still got it from the API. So there is no contradiction between dumps and local data for offline usage and an API. The API is just the means for delivery of that data. All right, so let's take a look at a concrete application. Say we want to answer a single question like, how many libraries are there in Germany? The traditional answer is 10,000. So is it, is it 10,000 or is it more like 20,000, which was an initial result we got when we asked and kind of asked our API this question. So let's take a look at how we can do this by using the Lobbit API. This is a um, single organization in our, in our API, and we can see that there is a type field which says that this particular organization is a library. So this is something that we, uh, that we will be using because we want libraries. And we have a address country field which is nested within an address within a list of locations. And this address country specifies that this is Germany. So here we see the data, and based on this we can create a query where we say the type should be library and the location, address, address country, this nested field, should be Germany. 
And in the result, we get a field which specifies the total number of results. So we have an answer for this question. It's 13,279 libraries in Germany, according to our data in our API. Now, as I said before, this initial request, it, it, it said about 20,000. So what about that? It's really that using lot for applications, by using the Lobbit API, we were able to improve the query. So in the initial query, we, we didn't consider the location because all our organizations in this API are German organizations, but they are not all inside of Germany, like Goethe Institutes. And we were able to improve our data. Because if your result is like the double of the common answer, the sanity check, what you're doing, and we realized that we were taking into account inactive libraries. So we really see that usage leads to improvement. All right, so let's take a look at a concrete application. Say we want to visualize data on a map, like the libraries in Hamburg. So let's take a look at how we can do that with the Lobbit API. The starting point, again, is a query like before. We say the type should be library, and the location, address, in this case we say address locality, not the address country, should be Hamburg. Now, if our question was how many are there in Hamburg, the answer would be up here, 153. But in this case, we want to use the data to create this map visualization. In particular, we want to use the geo coordinates down here. So a location has an address, but also a geo location. So to do that, we create an HTML file. In the head of the HTML file, we integrate a mapping library. We create a map down here, and then we call the Lobbit API with this very query. We say we want something with type library and location address, address locality Hamburg. Then we process the result down here and finally create a marker on the map using this geo latitude and geo longitude from the data. And what we get is this. I'll try to switch to a live version of this. Yeah, the connection is too slow. So you would see that you, could, you can zoom in and out, um, you can pan around, and you can click on these markers um, to get the name of the library. And this is all, um, this is, this is the, the complete file for the one, for the result that you saw. So something basic is very straightforward. All right, so that's how to build an interactive map by using the Lobbit API. Let's take a look at a more complex application. And the BIP is the regional bibliography for the German state of North Rhine-Westphalia. It's cataloged by the three so-called NRW Landesbibliotheken. So in the state of NRW, we don't have a single state library. We have a distributed model of three libraries. And the presentation is done by Habit Z. And the new presentation is based on the Lobbit API. So let's take a look at NVBIP. This is a details page for one title. And you can see here's a map. It also shows libraries, similar to the example before, just it's not libraries in some area, but it's the libraries with holdings of this particular title. We also have a, uh, a marker. If we click it, in this case, we zoom in. We get a link to the library, and we get a link to the local catalog. But it's the same idea as before. We have a pop-up on the marker with some details. Um, so something else that's interesting in NVBIP is that when cataloging, for every title, um, catalogers catalog a subject location. So they catalog the area or the place that this title is about. So this one, for instance, is about Cologne, my hometown. And what now we do is we take these labels and send them to Wikidata and get back the geodata for these labels. And based on that, we can do many nice things. For instance, we can have a geo search. So this is the starting page of NVBIP, where we have these administrative areas. I tried once again. This is too small in this resolution. But you could, you could search um, for titles related to places within these administrative areas. But it also allows us to have a sort of visualization of search results. So for instance, if we search for brown coal, we can see that in the east, of NIV, there are two single places related to brown coal. But here's a really big, then there are six places in the Ruhrgebiet, so there's a little, little relation to brown coal. But down here, we see there are 42 places related to brown coal in the so-called Rheinische Braunkohlerevier. So we get really a visualization of our search result. We can also use this to search again as in the administrative areas in the, in the starting page. So we can search for titles related to brown coal and places within this particular area. Oh, that was the wrong That was the wrong button. Mm. All 
All right, so here we saw what a complex application with map visualization and browsing could look like implemented in the way like the simple example based on an API uh, as, as I showed you be in before in the, simple, in the simple examples. All right, so as the next application, let's take a look at OpenRefine. Many of you know OpenRefine. Uh, it's been mentioned a few times already. Swip. It's a free open source power tool for working with messy data. That's what it calls itself. So it's based on a spreadsheet metaphor. So it's very familiar to people who work with spreadsheet software. It allows you to clean up your data, to do transformations, and to do reconciliation with external data sources, in particular APIs. So let's take a look at what this reconciliation means. We had a concrete use case where the user request of a user who had a, a list of libraries where for every library had a title and a postal code and for some the ID in the National German Library Index. And what he wanted was a uniform identifier for all these libraries. And that's exactly what reconciliation is about. Sending your data somewhere, asking, do you know about this data? Can you give me an ID? So let's take a look at how to do this with OpenRefine and the Lobbit API. So this is the starting... When you start up OpenRefine, this is what it looks like. It runs in a browser, for those of you who don't know it, but it's a, you can run it as a local application. It's not like you have to upload your data anywhere or something. It just happens to use the browser. In this dialog, we then open our, our data. It's a CSV file. OpenRefine automatically recognizes it. It recognizes that we have a semicolon as a delimiter. You can see here that there are many Im supported import formats in OpenRefine. You could tweak the import here. This is a preview the import all looks fine in this case, so we just create a project. <coughs> we now have this tabular data in OpenRefine. And what we want to do is we want to reconcile this column with the library names with the Lobbit API. So it works over this menu, but then we get a dialog where we select the reconciliation API. We enter the Lobbit API. We specify that we want to send the other data we have to improve the results. And what we get back is for every of these libraries, we get a list of suggestions from the API of possible matches with a rank. So we see here that for Stadtbücherei Werner, the best suggestion from the API is something called Stadtbücherei Werner with a score of one, and the other candidates have a very low score in comparison. Over here we see a visual representation of the quality of these suggestions, where we could remove, the, we see that over here there are very few with very low scores, so we could move the slider and remove this bad data so we don't pollute our data with wrong identifiers. Now what we do is we create a new column based on this reconciled column, which we call ID in this example. Then we use the open refund expression language to specify the value for this new column, for these new cells in this new column. And we say for each cell it should be the reconciliation result, the best result, the top one, and of that the ID. And again we get a preview here. We get these IDs, this looks good. So we create this new column over here where we have these uniform identifiers. No. All right. No. I'm sorry. This is not working. No. What's this? Okay, so that's, that was open refund reconciliation. Uh, there are instructions, detailed instructions, if you want to reproduce this uh, yourself. All right, so a little bit about what we learned uh, in, in building and using this API. Um, it's important not to lose any important data for your applications in the transformation to LOD, when you process your original data to LOD. It's important to structure the data in a way that's useful for the application, so the application can send queries and process the response easily. And it's great to integrate into existing tools and workflows because if people use, for instance, OpenRefine, that's the place they would like to use your data in. So the main, the main lesson, the main thing we learned is really to let the applications drive the API and the data design, to avoid premature abstraction, to support actual use cases before generalizing, or to put it in a different way, do usable before reusable. And doing usable is great because having other folks use your stuff makes your stuff better. So this is how we make progress, by building, using, and improving stuff. So short note about how we built this particular API. 
We used MetaFactor, Elasticsearch, and the Play framework. Short version is Java programming with open source tools, but all kinds of tools could be used to build an API like this. So now you might be thinking, okay, but what about linked data, semantic web, and libraries? After all, this is SWIP. So one thing is, that structured data that you saw, it is JSON-LD, it is RDF compatible, it is linked data. But linked data and semantic web are really no goals in themselves. They're a technological solution, one of many that might fit the real goals. And no matter what our role is or our title, if we're catalogers, developers, or managers, the goal is always the same. It's to make the product better for our users. And that product is software in libraries. And that's another possible meaning of SWIP. So what's the thing to take away? It's really build APIs. We should build APIs, you should build APIs. They provide infrastructure for software and libraries. They make the great work of catalogers available for all kinds of use cases. That's why libraries need APIs. They empower yourself and others to use your data, beginning with simple cases as we saw in this question answering example, to build new applications, as we saw in the visualization examples, and to improve existing applications, like in the Rope and Refine example, where you suddenly have this data in your application. It's not like it happens by itself. It's not like you build an API and then all these things happen. For these things to happen, it takes an API and some large but finite amount of work. But the APIs are the foundation. They provide infrastructure for software and libraries. They empower yourself and others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabian.